now we will have uh, an opportunity to ask these uh, gentlemen some questions, and uh, I hope that uh, those of you who will take a little bit of uh, time here for those people who, who just have to leave, but uh, those of you who are interested in, in asking questions why uh, they've agreed to uh, uh, respond. So if you might be thinking of something that you'd like further detail on or something you'd like to ask. And some of the students will be picking these up and bringing them forward. And, uh, I'll read these so that they will be uh, heard by everyone. And uh, the first one here is for uh, Mr. Rutherford. What are some of the basic rules and procedures for, for, sec for securing wild or recreational lands as gifts, if there are any? Old Cap Sowers, who is the genius that got the 60,000 acres of land in the Chicago Cook County area, as the head of the Cook County Forest Preserve said, there's no such thing as worthless land. Take anything from an acre up. Now, I have found it surprisingly easy to get gifts of land. Several, the starting point, of course, is to know who owns it. You can go to the courthouse and get a plat book. In our efforts in communities, we have taken the plat book and had a printer make a large sheet about so big at half scale, the ordinary plat book, and it shows re reasonably accurately who the ownerships are. And you'd be surprised what a wonderful piece of gossip a thing like that is. You can see the whole works at once. It shows your park district boundaries, your roads and cities and things of this kind. And it's more fun to watch people look at that map and I didn't know Charlie owned that. Why hell, he hasn't got any kids. Why don't you talk him out of it, Bill? This sort of thing. First you get the information and then you let it be known that you want land, any land. I've had people say, well, really, I, I, I'm not like Mr. Detwater. I'm not a wealthy person. I couldn't give a park. And I say, you sure can. Let me tell you what we'll do with it if you want to, how you can have your cake and eat it. I've always given, uh, there's certainly a lawyer in your community to do the work without charge, which I've always done. If a man is even considering a gift, if he's going to take you to dinner, don't ask him to pay your hat check tip too. Make it as easy as you can on him. So if a person might be inclined, say, look, Really, there's no expense involved. We'll be glad to take care of that. Well, the abstract isn't up to date. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of it, please. Well, how about the legal expenses? None at all. Well, there's a few survey problems. Don't worry about it. Just solve all the things that could be an excuse for not, not, not making it happen. So it's right there cold. We can save you the real estate taxes. You can enjoy the lovely forest. Nobody's going to make a dump out of it or a subdivision or something else. Many people are embarrassed that somebody smarter than they are or make more money than they want to, but they don't want to go to the bother. You can save them that embarrassment. It'll never be known what it's worth because you make a gift of it. You can have th your pleasure in your generation and other people can enjoy it. It's an awful good trick to say, I, I realize you probably wouldn't want to use your name and I don't want to embarrass you, but would you mind if we did? Because it would really help us as an example of someone else. Oh, no, no, that's right. Well, I don't want to embarrass you. I wouldn't offend you for the world, but if you would give a little thought to it, I'd appreciate it because if I can point out that you've done this, it helps us set an example for somebody else. You save them a very obvious and embarrassing requirement of the gift, obviously, but you, you make it more graceful in the process. And you find it convenient to get, and for God's sakes, when you get a gift, get the people to write letters and say thank you. The worst thing we have in our manners in America, I think, is the fact that when a person does something nice, they never hear about it again. It doesn't cost very much it's around Christmas time to write a letter that did something nice a couple years ago and say, we often talk about that. I'm sorry I haven't seen you recently, but we think of you often and we do appreciate it. It was simply great. You'd be surprised how many times to follow up. Unsolicited courtesies mean a great deal more. Set the groundwork with sincerity. Don't just go hammer on a guy the first time you want something from him. Be willing to do something for him. Say a kind word. Support him in some action he's going to take. Whether it's a zoning problem or something else. Don't be afraid to do a courtesy without having an immediate response or immediate value received. It's surprising how often this bread cast in the water does come back. I hope that gives you a feeling of a little of it. Uh, he, two questions came up asking uh, relatively the same thing. Uh, Mr. Scott, uh, what is the most effective way of writing politicians? These are kinds of things which I hope we can get into in some of the uh, sessions tomorrow, but uh, uh, probably the most basic thing that determines the effectiveness of a communication to 
anyone is that it not just be a piece of paper. If they've got a name to hitch to a face, this ties in very nicely with what Mr. Rutherford was saying, uh, if there's some basis on which they should assume that your opinion uh, uh, is more than just a piece of paper that arrives in their office, uh, this is a, a crucial thing. Uh, you know, congressmen are frequent, and state legislators, uh, legislators are frequently back in their districts. They're not back there uh, uh, on pleasure trips so much as they're back there to uh, get the pulse of what the public is feeling. It's a good opportunity to get to know them. Uh, frequently, people under the uh, legal voting age of 21 or whatever it is uh, now uh, feel that they will not receive any response. Uh, a congressman, even a senator, is only a human being. Generally, you influence and reach a man like that the same way you reach uh, anybody else. As Mr. Rutherford said, uh, the bigger they are, and it's true in politics uh, sometimes, uh, as well as other forms of uh, life, uh, the bigger they are, the, perhaps the easier it is to get through. Uh, perhaps the next most important thing is that your communication be genuine, that it reflect not just a demand that this man who you have magnanimously given your one vote to or, or threatened to uh, give to his opponent in the next election uh, do as you tell, but uh, the fact that he's a human being with human motives for being where he is who wants to serve uh, what he feels are the interests of, he con of his constituents that will put uh, him back in office again so that he can continue to serve them. That's true of about at least 90 percent of the, the members of the Congress. Uh, so you, you reach him by appealing not on emotional grounds, not in a threatening way, uh, but simply to say here is a problem, a real live problem that I have or here's an issue that I know something about and here's what I think about it and here's why. Uh, a letter that says vote against the SST uh, is nice, it's better I suppose in some ways than no letter at all, but it doesn't count for much. Uh, a telegram is nowhere near as effective for the most part, uh, coming from a stranger particularly, uh, as a letter, even a handwritten letter. Uh, because a telegram, all you've got to do is pick up the telephone. You don't have to invest any effort in that. You just say a few words, somebody else takes it down, you pay them a lot of money, in it goes. The congressman knows that. If you've had to sit down and write a, a one-page, brief, to the point, a rational argument, that's the kind of letter that gets a response. Uh, and I guess the third thing that is, is really quite vital is that the subject that you raise, the question that you, that you ask, the, the decision that you seek to influence, that your communication be timely. Uh, this is a very hard thing to do if you're just sitting and, and picking up most of your news about these things from the newspapers. It helps not one whit to write to your congressman the day after the Des Moines Register indicates that the Redwood Park bill was passed in a lousy form and say, why did you pass that bill in a lousy form? What he's got to be hearing is about a week before that you want and expect and hope that he, for good and rational reasons, will respond in a positive way uh, on those questions. This is the whole point of national conservation groups, of organizations like your confederation at the local level, uh, is to plug you into a communication network so that you can get the word out in a timely way. Uh, and that's extremely important. Here are a couple of related questions for Mr. Rutherford. Uh, how could you, have, could you have accomplished what you did with the, uh, with the prairie if you had been j only a private citizen? And then, how do we get lawyers involved in our cause? Well, Goose Lake Prairie might not have been accomplished, certainly would not have been accomplished as easily as a private citizen, but the 22,000 acres in our community were. So whether you're talking about one piece of ground or some other, there's plenty of targets of opportunity. And getting the lawyers involved is relatively simple. Talk to a few of them. Get them interested. Tell them how you need them. Gee whiz, um, people are, are anxious to be of help if you're not just plain taking advantage of them and make work. The same reason a youngster doesn't like picking up cigarette butts as part of the environmental effort, but if he thinks it's something worthwhile, he can be sold and fascinated and pretty soon becomes not just a follower but a leader. It's the same thing. Talk to him. The same as you talk to a doctor about a public health problem or any other citizen. It's part of your salesmanship and evangelism. And here's one uh, for Mr. Scott. Do you think that it's better to organize a local coalition uh, of Iowa in action groups outside the traditional community structures uh, or community power structures, or should we attempt to move these powers inside the coalition if we can get them in?
basic thing that I would say about that is get anybody you can. If you can reach the 4-H club, if you can reach uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, by all means draw them in. Uh, now, likely is not. The practical facts are that people are going to form in a confederation and join together because they're similar sorts of people, they have similar sorts of values and interests, and they can see the advantage to their own individual values and interests of joining with common people for a larger thrust. Uh, therefore, it's not often uh, uh, terribly easy to draw together a coalition of great diversity because often that reduces only to the lowest common denominator to get people in. So you, you have to draw a boundary someplace. But ultimately, these decisions get made on issues. Uh, the circle of people in this room and others like yourself in communities throughout Iowa make a useful communications network on individual problems. Then when the word comes out that there is X problem in the state legislature and you get that word through a newsletter uh, or a hot telephone call that by Jove we need support in, uh, in uh, Jefferson uh, for uh, X problem, then you're in a position to go to those people with whom you have established friendly personal contacts uh, who may be Chamber of Commerce types, oil company executives, who knows, again, uh, following Ms. Mr. Rutherford's example, on a personal appeal basis and say, won't you help in this? And draw in on individual issues as wide a coalition as you can. But uh, to, to spread out the total grand overall confederation in an effort to draw in everyone uh, automatically imposes a lowest common denominator factor that will at some point weaken the return. Uh, so I think you, you organize because you're interested conservationists, you go into the community power structures and the state power structures the best way you can on individual issues for the most part. Uh, here's a, an interesting one for uh, Mr. Rutherford. Um, would you please give your views on the large uh, dam or dams proposed by the Army engineers just west of Peoria? I believe they are to be constructed on the Kickapoo River. Uh, we have several such confirmed projects in the Ames area, and one of them appears to be uh, appears to me to endanger the Legis State Park. My degree of reverence for the Corps of Engineers' accomplishments is somewhat minimal. We seem to find that the pork barrel has run to the effect that if you have a river, dam it up or straighten it out. If you've got a swamp, fill it in. you got a hill, cut it away. But change it. Spend money. So that with reference to the problems of Kickapoo Creek west of Peoria, um, the first thing that is very evident is why. I question very much the, the uh, formula used by the Corps of Engineers and by most government agencies to justify a particular action. It's usually a way to rationalize what they already decided to do. It's highly unscientific. You put a few more points because of recreation. I did a few years ago because it has a little more political clout. That doesn't make it any more beneficial or not. Uh, but the Corps of Engineers is simply the tool of thoughtless people that have an ax to grind. They're not demons in themselves. They're some competent, decent, dedicated public servants. I would love to see the Corps of Engineers used to their fullest way in treating water. Uh, sewage, pro uh, sewage problems, for example. Let's get some effective engineering out of them and some effective construction. Somebody will still be able to sell the concrete and get the jobs for his union and all the rest and take care of those little niceties, that, the plums, I guess, but at least it'll have some value to us. I'm extremely critical of the ordinary approach to building a dam when you know full well, I almost repeated the word, that uh, it'll sill in about 30 years and you put the actual cost against the benefits to have about 30 feet of muddy slime a few years hence, and it's somewhat unappeal unappealing. If we're going to have a dam in Kickapoo, and this particular one you ask about west of Peoria, it's been talked about since my earliest recollection, so I'm not in imminent fear of seeing much happen, but um, that one may have a little more validity on a point than I would ordinarily give it credit for, because the underground aquifer from Peoria west to the Mississippi River is almost non-existent. Potable water does not exist in any quantities. City of Galesburg has to pump water from the Mississippi River. The little towns out there, even the radar station at Hannah City, spent over $150,000 just to filter out enough water for a couple dozen men to drink because of the high iron content, high sulfur, high sulfur content, and very small quantity. Now, 
with the Illinois River being used to supply water for pure, I'm giving this as an example, uh, being used to supplement our aquifer, which is destroyed because Caterpillar Tractor Company paved over most of the natural sandy area where rain percolated into the San Cody field, and because we drain things so much quicker, besides spilling diesel fuels and all the rest into it, we're now using a reclaimed river water, which is a nice word for drinking out of the toilet. But um, we have the chlorinated hydrocarbons and all the rest of the additives. It might be that if the car bought enough land on the Kickapoo Creek to prevent the contamination from both the small communities upstream, from the agricultural waste, the siltation, all the rest, had some natural vegetative protection so it wouldn't fill in with silt almost overnight. It might provide some needed drinking water and domestic water for the various growth, and I don't subscribe to growth of the community anymore than I do my waistline, but it will grow, I'm sure, maybe both of them will. But uh, it may supply a water supply that could be valid. It even drains by gravity to the town, which has some benefits in terms of pumping. But just a plain put in another dam to spend some money, I am very much less than lukewarm. And then one final question for you. Uh, what is your opinion on actions such as campaign GM to make General Motors uh, responsible? It's a little hard to answer that because I'm not sure of all the ramifications. I have a little concern that we can pick out one SOB and just tear him to pieces and not prove a whole lot. We can do a great deal of damage if you deal with the full spectrum that a country lawyer does of dealing with people whose life savings are involved, whose employment's involved, whose products are involved. If we destroy GM, we can destroy an awful lot of good along with a little that, that's bad. I don't think that the solution comes from destroying a company and what it means to many people. And I don't happen to be a shareholder, so I'm not pleading a personal case. But I think that there may be a better long-range problem of the cooperation and the understanding. Maybe if we can, don't require 400 horsepower to drive to the grocery store, and don't buy those cars and use a little more logic in the products they can build, then we can find a way that we'll have less litigation and less lost time and more constructive result, I really think. Thanks very much. Fun being with you. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, two speakers uh, that we had this evening and uh, uh, Dr. Christensen for being with us. Um, we're looking forward to seeing all of you uh, tomorrow uh, between 8 and 9, uh, the session starts at 9, in Carver Hall, which is just up the walk from uh, the Union. And uh, I hope that you'll utilize uh, some of the time remaining in, in the evening to uh, get acquainted and, and talk. Uh, um, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, you're about to recognize